who's joined us. He's come uh, across from South Africa to be with us today. And he's the regional head of Google's developer programs by region. It's like a third of the world. Uh, I just like to say we would like to start a bit earlier because we have Hagas Ma Shams, some Shams, Shams Gay Tala, actually. Shams, the seal, Shaka Boyasa. Hagasal. Okay? So, Lulu is more, and how would the Tiki Petri show you? I'm Keda. I shan't. The model of Shams for her. Now, over to Andy. Give him a round of applause. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, having me today and giving me a chance to talk. I'm uh, glad to be have a chance to meet at least some of you today. I'm here with my team, uh, Mohamed Hintira, who runs Middle East and North Africa for developer relations on my team, and uh, Barsi Sigma, who runs uh, Turkey, Central Asia, and Southern Caucasus. So, thanks very much. Uh, I just want to kind of have a little chat and uh, share a few things with you. I've been told. Um, kind of a mixed crowd, entrepreneurs and developers. Raise your hand if you're a software developer again, just so I can get a count. Perfect. Okay. Cool. More. I love it. All right, cool. So, uh, I'm going to share with you kind of three things that I learned in the Valley that I think might be helpful. Um, and also talk a little bit about if you're building a web or a mobile application, some quality things. And it should be useful even to the non programmers in the Valley, just to kind of share with you a few things that I look for when I'm kind of looking at quality in the region. So, so hey, Andy, uh, from uh, California originally, um, lived in San Francisco for a long time doing startup things and uh, started, a few pro uh, started a company of my own, started a few products, as well as worked with some large companies. I moved out to South Africa about three years ago out of uh, a real love for kind of the region and getting more involved and also a, a real personal interest in South Africa. So. Actually, the, um, and then I've been out here for about three years now. So actually, the shirt I'm wearing today, um, I didn't know I was giving this talk, but it, it works out well. Um, the shirt, when I, bought the, when I brought the shirt with me, it's uh, made by a, a South African entrepreneur who um, was a clothing designer. She had a small business doing designing shirts and things. And it was right after the democratic transition in 94 when she uh, went to a talk that Nelson Mandela was giving. And she had one of these shirts she made, and she put it into a box and asked his bodyguard, like, please, please give it to him. She's like, I don't know what will happen next. And a friend of hers told her um, a week later, like, look at the newspaper. And she looks at the front page, and there's the president wearing one of her shirts, the shirt that she'd given to him. And so she started providing more and more of these kind of loud, you know, kind of wild shirts to him. And these became known as Madiba shirts. And her, her clothing business, Presidential, like, took off. She started opening multiple stores, like, had this whole thing going and created really this amazing, iconic shirt for uh, South Africa's first uh, Democratic president. So. Anyways, there's a little uh, little startup story in the shirt, so <laughs> there you have it. Um, cool. So yeah, as uh, introduced, I run developer relations in uh, uh, for Africa, Middle East, and uh, and beyond. We've got Turkey and Central Asia and Southern Caucasus in there. And when we look at developer relations at Google, we kind of look at it from a whole ecosystem perspective. So we don't just look at representing our, our platforms um, to different developers, though we do do that as well. But we look at the whole ecosystem, like where do software developers come from? Where are new kind of technology startups coming from? Are they getting the resources they need? How do they succeed and grow in the environment? And then how do they turn into kind of long-term successful technology businesses? So it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a lot of fun. And we have a bunch of programs kind of set up to help that. And one of the things we're doing here this week is learning more from all of you, what you need, what you're going through as developers and entrepreneurs, so we can better, have, better adjust our programs to fit what you need. So, the first tip I wanted to share with you was um, follow your passion. I know this is um, almost cliche, but it's something that's had a large impact on my life. And I really wanted to kind of share one small example of how that made a difference for me as an entrepreneur. So I was, um, many years ago in the late 90s, I was working at a company and we were doing um, a product that wasn't, that wasn't really working out. And we were trying to think of new things to do. We were kind of really moving forward on this one idea and iterating over and over again. And um, at the time, the startup I was at, we were looking for new ideas. And I'd also just been to, uh, to Burning Man, the festival in Nevada, and I had a chance to DJ a radio station that and kind of reach this whole community of people and get this feedback. And for me, this was like an intoxicating experience. Like, for the first time, 
I didn't know that I liked the same music as other people. I just thought all my tastes were, were pretty uh, abstract. So having a chance to connect with people through music was an incredible experience. But the, the whole event is only a week long. You have DJ a few times, you go home. But I missed this, and I wanted to try to find a way to capture it and kind of carry it on. And so I looked at using uh, some off-the-shelf radio broadcasting software and uh, creating a radio network with my friends online. And that became kind of a small project we started doing. And then I brought it into work and looked at scaling it up. And we looked at kind of giving away radio servers to anybody to broadcast their own radio station. And uh, we built a simple community model and plan, a simple viral marketing plan. Put it out there, recruited our first you know, 50 broadcasters or whatever. And um, overnight, the radio side of it sort of grew geometrically. And I think, um, I don't remember the exact stats offhand, but I think it was about six months until we became um, roughly the second largest online radio network in the world. And um, all based on giving everybody the same opportunity that I had at Burning Man, kind of DJ a little bit, reach a crowd of people. And so people would show up, create their own stations, and you know, reach a crowd of people. Then they would come to listen. Then they could create their own station and do that with their friends. And it just kept going on and on and on. So I think there's a lot of power to be gained by really kind of just following the things you love as, uh, in your personal life and professional life and kind of guiding your startup down that way instead of trying to kind of do whatever, you know, what other people are doing and kind of find your own way. And I've been really proud to see you know, some of the things happening, the number of uh, accelerators and incubators here, the number of things happening this, the campus itself. Like clearly there's a lot of emphasis on this already. So uh, yeah, it's great. It's really uh, positive to see. And can people hear me okay? Yeah. So the thought number two I have is that your company is a product. I always feel like any startup has two products. The thing that you're actually giving the consumers that they're using, and then your culture, your company culture, like what you, you know, what your company is like, how you do things, how you track success, how you treat each other, how you work together. This is this to me is super important. And so I think it's great to really think about those consciously as your startup grows and really create a a very strong corporate culture. Um, but I think corporate culture is kind of a weak, to me that doesn't say, say at all. I really think of it as a product, something that needs attention and management, measurement, and, you know, innovation. All these things should go into what your company is. Um, and one kind of uh, thought I had along those lines is, have you, have you ever seen the uh, Google Ventures YouTube channel? So we, we published a series of videos about um, you know, some best practices learned at Google, and for advice for startups. And there's a bunch of great resources in there, including things about how Google itself works, and like how, we do, how Google uh, practices have kind of evolved over time. Like there's a video on OKRs that's been watched a lot that talks about how we track our goals at Google and how things work there. But there's also a video just about workplace design. And it just looks at like how do you, you know, how does Google design an office? And how do you kind of create spaces for people to kind of run into each other and have that serendipity? Um, how do you kind of measure like what's the quality of, and how does that, how can you measure the impact of that? How can you look at the impact of like, you know, the food you provide, how do you measure and optimize all these things? So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of thinking that's gone into it and it's worth checking out the videos and taking a look. You can find all that stuff in the Google Ventures YouTube channel. And the third thing I, I wanted to share with you is just really showing your users that you're listening. Again, I think everyone knows you should be listening to your target audience and things like that. But you don't always get a chance to sort of demonstrate to them that you're listening to what their needs are, what they want from you. And uh, this, I think, is super important. So one example of this uh, is like if you're doing any beta testing, which presumably you're testing your product with your target audience. Um, and I'll share kind of later a few best practices for how you can do that. But making sure that you've got a feedback cycle going with your audience so they know the changes you're making and why you're making them. It's not just, okay, here's version two, and now we've added these five features and fixed these three bugs. But it's like, hey, we really heard that you really wanted feature X, and like that's why we've added this in here. Um, getting the message back to them, like for example, if you have an app in the Play Store on Android, and you get five people posting comments saying, what are you gonna add feature X? You can reply to each one of them and say, okay, great, you know what, version two is out, we added it, check it out, send us your feedback, we'd love to hear what you think. And the more people see that you're listening to them, the more they feel engaged and part of that product development process as kind of you know, very um, active members of the community using the product. The better, um, the better experience they'll have with it, the more they'll talk to other people and kind of help share the message with you. So I think this is a really crucial thing for any startup. We get away from this before you could have feedback. 
Cool. So those are uh, three thoughts I had about startups. And then I wanted to share with you a few ideas on kind of high quality apps. When I talk about apps, I mean not just like, you know, uh, downloadable apps for a phone, but also mobile app, uh, web-based applications and things like that. Really, you know, programs in general, apps. So the first thing is really focusing on like, how do you measure your app quality? You know, finding some metrics you can use. Um, if you're uploading into one of the app stores, it's pretty straightforward. You've got an average star rating. There's a pretty good practice for that. You can track that data over time. Uh, there's different third-party tools you can use to kind of drill into that. You can look at user engagement in your application. You can do funnel tracking for goals and kind of see how all that's moving along. And all these things map back to quality. But also, like, um, kind of some tools you can use on web, for example. Um, I'll skip past this. We talked about really kind of, you know, whatever your funnel goal is at the end, quality should lead to better, better delivery of your goal, in this case, uh, monetization. And I'll go into some of the web-based tools in just a moment here. Keeping it light, so really focusing on minimum viable product, keeping your UI simple and, and not confusing. I remember one product experience I've had in my life when I took over a new product that was pretty complex. We were trying to figure out how to better compete with other people. We started by removing features from the product and actually taking things out, reducing complexity, so we could focus on what our core value proposition was. Which, uh, and so that's one thing I think is really important, like simplicity, focus, and not being afraid to even like take things back out or simplify things. You know, less lines of code, less features, less memory usage, all these things. And then on the quality front for tools, we have a, a set of tool, web tools called PageSpeed Tools. Anybody can use this. You don't have to be a developer to use PageSpeed Tools. Just go to the URL, and it's a, um, just type in whatever the URL is of your website. And then we'll go through and run a bunch of tests against it and look for ways you can optimize your web experience. So it'll tell you, like, oh, you could be using image optimization over here, or you've got really small touch targets when you render this on a smartphone. Um, you know, all kinds of different different little tips in there, both technical ones like image optimization and uh, file optimization and user experience ones. And it will break out the test suites by both mobile and desktop devices. So this is a really handy tool you can use. Page speed, just search for page speed tools and something like And then um, another thing is kind of making sure people are connected to support. One question I get a lot is sort of like, you know, can I, can I, great to meet you, Andy, can I send you lots of kind of technical questions, or how do I make sure I'm connected to the community? And one area, especially for, I think for Android and a lot of it uh, as a platform, is looking at um, Stack Overflow. Like they've got an amazing set of communities around support, and you'll find a lot of your information you need should be there. And uh, if, you do, if you have a new question that hasn't already been answered, you can submit it. And I think Stack Overflow is fantastic support. So that's an area, um, I think that I see a lot of the developers nodding their heads. So you already know this, which is perfect. Glad to see that. Another area is the Google Developers YouTube channel. So um, obviously we have all our developer documentation and information on the Google Developers site. But also on the YouTube channel, we spend a lot of time going into more detail about you know, whether it's the content from I.O., which is coming up later this month, and we'll be posting all that information online, as well as there's a, I believe an I.O. Extended, there's some, an I.O. Extended session in Cairo being run by the Google Developer Group. But we also post information like, you know, um, dev bytes, where we go into detail on like new, new API releases, or new kind of areas of interest to specific developers. We have a great UI series going on the channel. Um, there's one called uh, Android Beautiful Design that really looks at what a beautiful Android app looks like. Like not just to say you're following the design patterns which you should be doing, but how can you innovate on top of the design patterns and really create something new. So they look at top examples from around the world. And if you have an amazing Android app and you're doing beautiful design, please come talk to me after this. I'd love to learn more about it and hear what you're doing. So, um, and there's a, a whole kind of series of things as well as in multiple languages. And uh, there's a lot, lot of content going on in there. So kind of segueing over a little bit into design, I think uh, this is one of the things I can't say, t talk about enough is really making sure you have uh, an app that's easy to use, well designed, and kind of leveraging the Android design patterns. So we publish a whole library of things where you can find all the kind of information on how to design your app. Um, I think the more you can use this, this, uh, these pre-existing design patterns so your app is familiar to other people who are already using Android apps, 
and you kind of focus on the core innovation that makes your product unique and the thing you're really trying to get. This is uh, this could be really helpful. And so, looking kind of beyond just sort of the current, the, the, the existing design patterns, the big changes that have come up have been uh, material design, which was released across both Android and web. So, if you look at Android, of course, we've been updating all the apps, there's a ton of information online. But also with Polymer, you can do the same type of material design that's in the new version of Android on the web. And I was glad to see it looks like, uh, I, think, I believe WhatsApp is using this now on their new, uh, on their new web implementation, which is fantastic to see. Um, we've got all the materials there you can check out. There's web demos of how these elements work. And it's really a cool, uh, it's a really cool experience. So I recommend, if you're, a web, if you're designing a web application, check out Polymer, see what you think. It's, uh, it's quite fast and simple. And the really cool part is also, I think, being able to unify your design. So for the first time, you can have a native application with a material design and a web application sharing the same design with the same components, no matter what, uh, what platform people are using. And another thing, like, this sounds pretty elementary, but it's, it's something that people don't always think about, is making sure to design for both tablet and phone on the same application. So that's something we really look at when I'm thinking about kind of quality in the Play Store and checking out applications. I always grab a tablet and install the same app onto it and check, like, how does it render on a tablet? So that's important uh, if you're, uh, as a developer, that you're going through, make sure you take a look at uh, at, least, uh, at least a tablet or two to kind of look at different screen sizes, as well as kind of the new larger screen phones that are becoming more and more popular. Ah, and then one of my favorite new topics, beta testing. So you can do a um, target before you launch, target for every release, keep testing both with your, with your audience before you push your product out. So, uh, one thing that I've seen developers doing more and more, which has been really helpful, is running a test with um, the Google Plus community. So we've integrated this stuff with the Android console app. So you can go and instead of manually specifying a list of users, you can set up a Google Plus community, add the Google accounts of all the folks who are going to be in your test group. Like, I found kind of the sweet spot lately, it's been about 50 to 100 users who represent the people that are going to be using your app, help with a range of devices, you know, folks from each of kind of the different types of audience, I don't know how many personas you're designing for, but making sure that you're targeting, get them all in there. And then whenever you release a new version of the app, post into the group and say, okay, we've released version, you know, 0.2, here are the five 